Oye, oye, oye. Anyone have any business for the King's Justice of the Superior Court of Justice? Attend now and you shall be heard. Long live the King. The Honorable Justice Hennessy presiding. Please be seated. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, all. Good morning, Mr. Marcello. Morning, um, Mr. Schachter's on seat. Yes. Group of seven counsel uh, indicated that they uh, might be a little bit late and they asked that uh, not to hold up for them, that they will look at my notes and if that's good. Thank you very much. Sir. Uh, Your Honor, I have a few brief points and I'll hand over, um, keep us on schedule. I want, to, I want to begin by responding to a couple of points Mr. Bass raised. Uh, and these will all be kind of bing, bing, bing. Uh, he, he, he said, if I understood him on the point of control, that control really didn't matter that much because the historical pattern had been that the annuities were paid, uh, paid out to the individuals. I think that was the thrust of what he said. And then he said other stuff, which I'll address. And on the point of individual payment, I, I just want to say that I, I, with great respect, I think the submission is off, is off the mark. I think this case at this point is about collective annuities. But even at the individual uh, level, there's still two difficulties with the submission. And, the first one is that to pay out more than $4 in the world we now find ourselves after the um, stage one proceedings, there would be a need to exercise the graciousness clause because you would now be going over the $4 cap. And we don't know um, what would have happened. I mean, it really calls for a high level of speculation to say what the Dominion would have done. And, it is very important in my submission to remember the overarching control that the Dominion had over First Nations financing. Nobody's justifying that, but that's the way it was. And it overarches this entire discussion about would or would not have happened. And so I hear comments about speculation that there wouldn't have been a 60-40 type of investment. And I would suggest to your honor, the speculation is actually in the other direction. There isn't any co cogent evidence to suggest that the government would have invested in a 60-40 portfolio uh, for the plaintiffs because the government did all the investing back in the day or that they would have handed money over uh, to the First Nations to, to do such a thing. So at the individual level, returning to that, there is the, there is the problem of you know, speculating about what the graciousness class might have done. Can I just go back to how, uh, what I think is a, a bit of a repeated theme, that the government exercised a high degree of control in the day. And that day was certainly the days of banned trust accounts. Yes. Well, it was much longer. I mean, and and possibly preceded that. But following that for many years. Oh, following that. And but the banned trust accounts. I, I thought you took the position. You or Ontario took the position that the monies that would have flowed from the treaty were not Indian monies. Yeah, they're not Indian monies in the sense. I think Angel said they were, and he's probably legally wrong about that. I think. I think it's kind of a red herring, the Indian money point, because it's a question of whether it's under the Indian Act or not. And we're, we're not saying that. Okay. Uh, so if, but I thought the characterization as Indian monies was a characterization that triggered being controlled, put, controlled in the banned trust accounts. No. The fact of the trust accounts and the control that the government had over the trust accounts is the key point. It's, it's, it's separate from from what the regime set up in the first Indian Act in 1876 and many amendments and finally loosening the, as Ms. Evans said, finally loosening the, the reins a little bit, a little bit in 1951 or so. Uh, but the, the control is over the trust accounts. 
And, and, and really, these were bookkeeping entries, right? I mean, that, but how did they get in the trust accounts? They're bookkeeping entries. No, no, but how did they, what sums went into the trust accounts? The trust accounts, as I understand uh, the evidence from, from Mr. Angel, were, were really their, their clerical ledgers, their, their bookkeeping entries by the Dominion government to reflect the value of the annuities and their book to the treaty wide accounts. And that is almost exclusively how the annuities were paid. So they're booked into the treaty wide accounts and then they're, they have a folio there and then they're debited and credited. And they fell as Angel described it into the uh, interest uh, segment. If you think there's the band trust accounts have two prongs, the principal or capital prong and the interest annuity prong. So they get booked in at the treaty wide level <clears throat> and then booked out as they're paid. So it's kind of like a checking account the way we would think of our checking accounts when we used to have those. Not much stays there for long in, on the annuity side. Capital accounts, different story. So the annuity accounts were in the checking account side. Yeah, you could roughly. All of that? Yeah. But the, so that money was accessible. To the bands only if it was only if it was released. Approved. I mean, the I'm sorry. Approved is that? Work? Yeah, approved. Ultimately approved. Yes. And so you remember for for this treaty, uh, testing my own memory here, but I think uh, pretty sure about this. The 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 money actually was advanced by Mr. Simpson uh, of the HBC, right? In, in early early days. Yeah, in, early, in the early in the early early days, and then and then paid back by the Dominion in due mm -hmm. course. So that's how that's how it kind of worked. But that all of this is to support your thesis that it is unlikely that augmented annuities would have been freely paid out to the bands. That's right. I mean, we, you know, there isn't any, I suggest to you, there isn't any, and I've gone through exhibit 75 and we talked about Elder Donio's evidence about, you know, the, the sand river uh, situation and on all of that. I'm not going to repeat all that, but, and I, I think I ended last day with Mr. Angel's paragraph 94 in his report. And, and, and uh, so, so that was the regime. So the speculation comes in at saying, well, in the face of this regime, you know, we're still going to do a 60-40. Well, that doesn't, to me, I suggest to you, it just, just seems highly, highly unlikely. And what about after 1950? Do you have anything to say about that? After 1950, I, I, don't, I don't see... I don't want to speculate about it, but I don't see any evidence of, of that. I don't, I didn't see any evidence of it until we went into the uh, Chief Tanji's evidence about Mitchell and uh, how they transformed after they got the land settlement money and how they used that. Um, I stand to be corrected on that, but I don't recall any investments. I think Mr. Angel uh, said in paragraph 47 of his report, that he didn't see any evidence of investment in securities after 1860. Because 1860 was the watershed year where the government kind of went, wait a minute, we have a role as guardian here and we need to not do risky stuff or allow risky stuff to be done because they had, I think that Grand River navigation thing on their minds. There's a whole book about that, by the way, if you're ever interested in reading it, just the Grand uh, River Navigation Company. Um, so, so that's the whole background, and, 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 it, and it's why I say, with respect to my friend, that this hot idea of investing in a 60-40 portfolio, it just seems, it just seems highly, highly uh, unlikely. Thank you. Second area with your leave. My friend, Mr. Bass, um, took some issue with Professor Bodeway's uh, statement in his report that only 11% of pension funds were held in equities in 1961. And the thrust of Bodeway's evidence, um, we have this for you at 
uh, tab 42 and tab 43 for your convenience. Don't need to go into it probably, but it's there for you. Um, the thrust of his evidence. Remind me which volume that would be. Volume, which vol volume three of four, mine, yeah. 42 and 43. Thank you. So, I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, the thrust of Bo Professor Bodeway's was evident, evidence was, look, even in 1961, we're only 11% uh, into securities. And he said that, you know, he thought probably before 1961, it would have been, you know, the same or lower, but he said, you know, I really shouldn't say that. I'm only speculating about, about what would have happened before. And he says that after 1961, you know, things changed. Now this is pension funds, right? So this is the idea of, of, of First Nations, you know, say individuals somehow who were dispersed all over, you know, would get together and say, let's pool all our investments in a, a pension fund like account, or secondly, that maybe the collective annuities might have been pulled into some kind of pension fund thing. And, and well, the, and the big sums would have been collective only. It would have been. The big sums would have been the collective sums. Yeah, I mean, I think we're talking in this case about collective collective sums. And 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 so Bodeway's saying, Professor Bodeway's saying, um, there's this evidence doesn't subject suggest a very high level of investment in securities. That's his point. And, and I think my friend's point is, uh, well, you know, look at the table, which is at our tab, tab 42, and you'll see there are other riskier types of investments there. But the evidence is pretty foggy. Yeah. When you look at it, The number at issue in the first place is the $448 in uh, uh, column, 1961. So if you were to use that as a numerator and put it over the total asset value, which is in the first row there, 4,073, I think if you put 448 over 4073, uh, I hope, I don't know, I think you get 11%. That's kind of the that's kind of the arithmetic, uh, but if you the point here I want to make is that look the seventy six percent of these investments still were in bonds of one sort or another, pretty conservative investment seventy six percent if you do the arithmetic on this table we're still invest invested in bonds we don't know the percentage of corporate bonds which yes would be a little riskier than canada savings bonds and probably less risky than securities but we don't know that because there was no cross examination on this point that we could remember or find which introduces a second problem in the submission which is the rule in dun and brown because if he's being impeached professor bodeway on what he said here it should have been put to him and it was not, so far as we can remember or find, put to him. Well, Brown and Dunn rule is an evidentiary rule. It's about calling evidence. Well, it's it's also about, I think, uh, you know, arguing to impeach somebody when you have not put the proposition to them when they were in the box. That's where the fairness comes in. Because nobody cares about it if you don't argue. When you argue, you should have put it to them. Now... I don't think it's got legs as an argument anyway, for the reason I said. I was just going to say, that's your argument. That's not legs. Yeah, that's my argument. It's all my, of course. It's all my. <laughs> um, last point on this is I just want to, I know people can keep saying it's in our written material, it's in our written material, but boy, you know, you have a lot of written material. So I, on occasion, want to try to highlight some of it and, and this is the point about um, Mr. Bass saying, I think, that we use Canada savings bonds rates as our really only metric or main metric for our opportunity cost assessment. And that is not right. It is very much a backseat, uh, I don't want to say afterthought, but it's a supplementary point. And if you look in our submissions 
main submissions from paragraphs 509 to 516, you will see this laid out. And you will see that our argument for long-term bond rates is based on the three factors in the Bank of America account, opportunity costs, risk, and inflation. And that the restitutionary element referred to by the BOA uh, decision, that's where the savings to the government enters the play, right? That's where, that's the only part where that comes in. The rest of the analysis is based on the BOA factors. And so the assessment of damages can take into account rest, a restitutionary element. Um, and, and, and so that, that's where that plugs in, but it is very much a, a secondary point when you read our submissions in context, it's, they're principally driven by an analysis of the Bank of America case. Uh, another uh, point is, is just, I wanted to say briefly something about Mr. Schachter's argument that people on the ground in Anishinaabe on the ground in 1850 would have expected a, a real rate of return. Do you recall that submission? So I just, it's a, it's a, yet another uh, uh, it's another problem if you go there because both uh, professors Bodeway and Smart on one hand and Stiglitz and Mr. Hutchings on the other, they use nominal rates to in their bring forward in their present value analysis. All the experts use nominal rates of interest and Nobody used real rates of return. It makes sense not to use real rates of return because the, the, the numbers being used in the analysis, the annual nominal values, they're all, they're all nominal rates too. They're not adjusted for inflation. They're all nominal rates. So they use nominal on nominal to bring their values forward, apples to apples. And using real rates really doesn't make any sense for that reason. It would also, frankly, it would, it would generate much, much smaller uh, values and present value values. So another way to think of it is like, that's how they did it, nominal on nominal. If you wanna do it the other way, you gotta, you, have, you gotta convert all the nominal values every year into real values. And then if you wanna do that every year, convert everything to real values and bring them all forward uh, to present value based on real values, your, your apples to apples again. But you can't mix them up, and the experts didn't mix them up. I'm almost, I'm almost finished. Um, brief word on the Graham case or the central mortgage case. I don't know how you think of it, Graham or central mortgage. I, we were, there are criticisms of our use of this case or of this case, I guess it's better to say in a plaintiff's reply at paragraph 116. And um, we think the criticism of the case are off base and that the case is still uh, so still good law. And we have at um, tab 51, just prepared a, a, a very short piece to save grinding through all these cases. A very short piece for your honor uh, as to why we say um, these criticisms are uh, not meritorious. These criticisms of Graham, it's at tab 51. So this is your summary of these of right. cases and you're following a line it, from- It's our response to their paragraph 116, basically. Just put in a more economical uh, way. 
I have, I think, two more points, and I'll hand hand this off in the interest of time. So let me know. Are you are you okay for me to move on? Yes. Yes. Uh, so, I just I want to correct something from the plaintiff's reply. Uh, I, I don't know if it will be important. Would have been important to your honor. You, you might not have cared about it in any way. I don't, but I don't know. So, I want to address it. It's paragraph one nineteen, the plaintiff's reply, because I think it. It's a bit misleading, uh, again, unintentionally, I'm sure, misleading about what is going on uh, on, this, on this issue that's talked about here. My friends say Bodeway and Smart defined a joint, joint venture not in the way that Ontario does in its written submissions, but as an agreement where two or more adventurers join together to collab collaborate on a particular project and in so doing share profits, losses, and expenses. Now, they do refer to that. Uh, they do refer to that. I mean, I, it's worth maybe just quickly calling up tab 52. And tab 52 is? This is a reproduction of paragraph 165 of the Smart and Bodeway Present Values Report. And it's the paragraph that our, my friends are addressing. And we respond to that in paragraph 437 of our, or we address this, I'm sorry, in paragraph 437 of our main submissions. But the point of this, I suggest to you, is not the definition of joint venture. Let's say Smart and Bodeway accepted that definition. The point of this evidence is that they say, in their opinion, this does not look like a joint venture. That's what they're saying there. That's why they're bringing up, they're saying, here's a duck. This doesn't look like a duck. The Business Development Bank has told us what a duck is. This is no duck. It's a goose. And they call it, and they go on and they explain why the transaction in their mind is more akin to a, a, a purchase of land than it is to a joint venture. That's the purport of the, of the evidence. And I just, when you're reading it, I just wanted your honor to be alive to that because there's so much detail in this case, your job is so difficult. Is that Ontario's bottom line position? This is more like a purchase of land. Uh, it's more like a purchase. Yes, it's more like a purchase of land than it is like a joint venture. And we address that at some length. And is it like a purchase of land, notwithstanding comparing it to a joint venture or not? Is that, is that how you characterize it? It is more, I mean, I, I don't know that it fits either definition. So this is a nuanced thing. I think what they're saying is it's more akin to a purchase of land. Uh, anyway, that's how I would interpret what they're saying. It's more akin to a purchase of land than it is to a joint venture for a whole bunch of reasons. And that's where Graham comes in and other, that's where the $10 and anyway, that that that's where I'm not going to repeat everything in our and written material. Graham, I, I, I don't have a quick familiarization with the names of these cases. Graham is also Bank of America. No, no, Graham is an old. It's been around since Rex was a pup. That case, it's from 1973. <laughs> it's it's uh, it's a. Uh, I don't even remember what court it's out of, but it keeps coming up in the. I no, it's a. Uh, we can get a reference for you in our uh, in our. Um, book and 1973 is so far away ago that <laughs> that it's still good law it's a testament to what a strong decision it was in the first place right it's good. still okay. tab 49 of what oh we reproduced it for you in the authorities or in uh I'm being told we actually reproduce. I wasn't going to go into it because it's too too long. No, oh yeah, 
Green Court. Yeah, it's it's at Tab Forty Nine. We reproduced it there. Thank it's you. Reference a few times in our in our main submissions, and there's a couple of the boxes there that we say they are not checked in the joint venture uh, on the joint venture test. Um, the last point I wanted to make was about the code wind smart annuities model. And I, I think um, maybe a little bit too much uh, weight has been given to the sort of way they named it originally. And it is important to note, I would suggest that Professor Smart offered four reasons in support of his, his model, their model not just Fidel Anderson. And he, we have reproduced in the compendium at tab 55, uh, tab 55, three slides, actually four slides, uh, where he goes through the reasons again, just as a bit of a refresher as to why he, why they think this model uh, works. And I just would, I would commend that to you and then turn to um, a reference to the chart, which appears at paragraph 216 in our main submissions, 216 main submissions. It's in the compendium at tab uh, 56. And this is the last thing I'm gonna say, subject to your honor having questions. And this is their numerical bottom line on the whole case, as it were. This is them going through their four options. And you'll remember that the risk adjusted option is, is number four there. And that's, that's where you get that $84.8 million in the bottom right corner. That's the only one of those three options that's a risk, risk adjusted number. All the rest of them are not risk adjusted numbers, but they do use the smart and bode way numbers otherwise. And so you have a thing that says revised figures, 999 million. If you go to the right of that, you see past compensation annuities payable, 302 million were paid, 999 taken from, uh, take away 302 gives you the 697. So they're saying, if you give, uh, if you feed 100, if you're gonna feed 100% of the NCRs, allowing for what's been paid into the annuities machine, the number is six, 697. And then they go down and they do it for an 84% um, model and then they do it for a 50% model. But again, only the last one, which is their preferred option, but only the last one depends on the risk, uh, the risk adjusted analysis, Your Honor. When, um... You used this term, put in the annuities machine or something. I thought you were using that the last time um, to refer to the risk adjusted model, but that's not right. You, because you just referred to options one, two, and three as take, for instance, in option one, 999, put it into the annuities machine and you get, right. but that's not what's going on. 999 is based on their calculation from nominal value, their nominal values, isn't right. it? Right, without a, without risk adjustment. Right, and the only difference between 999 and 697 is the subtraction of the already paid annuity. That's right. Okay, thank you. So your honor, unless you have any uh, questions, um, I'm kind of off the list and I'll hand over to, to my colleague. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Now, Taylor, I think you need all the volume for. Oh, okay. When, he, when he's ready. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, sir. Your Honor, we've handed around and up volume four of Ontario's compendium. Thank you. 
And I'll ask to mark this as the next lettered exhibit, which I believe is double P. Thank you. Thank you. So the exhibit will be Ontario Compendium Volume 4, and the subtitle will be... Your Honor, I might call it Remedies. Remedies, thank you. On Remedies. When you're ready, Mr. Rankin. Your Honor, to streamline my submissions, I'm going to proceed a little bit differently from the sheet which Ms. Barkley handed up last week. So I'm gonna start with the duties at issue and I'm gonna to try to address your honor's questions of my colleagues in respect of the duty of diligent implementation. I'll then cover remedies, including how to approach a financial award in this case. And in that context, I'll address your honor's question about the meaning of sacred in the vocabulary of the Supreme Court. I'll then address the future and the timing of the judgment. And Your Honor, I should be able to address all these points in a little over an hour, so I've left plenty of time for engagement with the court. It's good that by the last day we have this working. <laughs> I want to be clear that if my friend needs more time than an hour, he should take it. Um, I've looked at our time. We are not pressed for time if he finishes at lunch. Very good. Thank you. Well, Your Honor, I thank Mr. Schachter for that. Now, Your Honor, as I indicated, I'm going to start with Your Honor's question of my colleagues about the duty of diligent implementation and how that fits into our analysis. And in that regard, it would be helpful for us to separate two du duties at issue in this case. The first duty, that's the obligation to increase and pay the annuity when the condition is met. And I'll refer to that in my submissions as the augmentation promise. And that's largely reflected in the judgment at par stage one judgment at paragraph 1A. And Your Honor, we need to separate that from the second duty, which is grounded in the honor of the crown. And that's the duty of diligent implementation of the treaty. And under the stage one judgment. Can I just. Of course. Um, I'll. I don't want to throw you off your game, but having had this interaction over the last week, it occurs to me that there's some artifice in this separation because the duty of the crown includes the duty of, what's it called, diligent implementation. And wouldn't the duty of diligent implementation include the duty to increase and pay the annuity when the conditions are met? Yes, Your Honor. And as I'm going to develop in my submissions, both Ontario and Canada have duties that arise from the honor of the crown, but they're different duties. And I'll come to Manitoba Métis, which... Uh, that's, uh, don't go too far on that. It's just when you separate the duty to increase and pay from the duties flowing from the honor of the crown, I'm putting to you, isn't the, the duty of... Uh, diligent implementation, which flows from the principle of honor of the crown, doesn't that duty also include the duty to increase? I'm not saying that it that there aren't subsets of duties within that, but I raise it only because you seem to distinguish it from a duty that flows from the principle of honor of the crown. Yes, Your Honor. And the way I would answer that is we have to look at what the duty of diligent implementation requires separately for Canada versus Ontario. Okay. And for Canada, it requires augmenting and paying the annuity. And I'm going to come to this. That's the Constitution 111, 112. For Ontario, the context is different. And it involves providing information to Canada so that Canada can fulfill its duties under the treaty. So both crowns are subject to the duty of diligent implementation, but it's contextual and the duties are different. Okay, thank you. And I have that, I have that distinction in your argument. So Your Honor, I'm gonna get into that in a little bit more detail in a moment, but I wanna say a few words about the augmentation problem. So that first aspect that I, that I mentioned. 
And what I want to be clear about, and this is, I think, responsive to your honor's questions last week, the crown allocation arguments that the court has heard from Ms. Barkley and Mr. Marcello, those relate to the augmentation promise, the duty to augment and pay the annuity. The augmentation promise is a pre-confederation liability for which Canada alone is responsible. And this is the reason why it's important to draw this distinction. Only Canada has that obligation to augment and pay the annuities under the treaty. And that's because section 111 of the British North America Act substituted the dominion for the UPC as the debtor under the treaty. It's a constitutional provision. The debtor under the treaty. Correct. So there's two duties going on. There is the obligation to pay, it's a debt. And then there's a duty flowing from the honor of the crown, which is different. I'm going to come to that. That has a whole separate analysis. But in terms of the obligation to pay, it's a debt. And Section 111 replaced the UPC with the Dominion. It's a statutory novation. Now, given that provision and the, the framework of the Constitution, Canada might have and I mentioned, and I emphasize might, might have in, a, a right to indemnity from Ontario and Quebec under section 112. That's the way that it works. There's the obligation for Canada to pay and then a indemnification from Ontario and Quebec. But as the court heard from Ms. Barclay, the governments, and by which, by that I mean Canada, Ontario and Quebec, they settled that aspect, the identification aspect through award 15. And award 15 is enforceable. On Friday, Mr. Marcello was speaking about how section 112 works in that alternative world where section or rather award 15 isn't enforceable. And that's where we get into this question about 5% simple interest. Section 112 says right in it 5% interest. And everybody at the time understood that was simple interest, compound interest. It wasn't until 2002 that the common law accepted compound interest. So I'm gonna to come to Bank of America on that in a moment. So that's the alternative world. And sections 111 and 112, they overtake any common law doctrines that Canada might say could make Ontario directly liable. Sorry, did you say that's the alternative argument? Or Sorry, Your Honor. I miss those words. The, the alternative argument. Alternative world. Alternative world, that's right. So in the alternative world where we don't have a word 15, then we have to ask ourselves, how does, how does section 112 kick in here? And the answer is 5% simple interest on amounts Canada actually paid. That's how that works. Now, in terms of the common law, because can Canada raises some common law doctrines, which have been described as the common law of state succession, we deal with that in our written submissions, Your Honor, starting at paragraph 272, that's our main submissions. And on, on state succession, I'm going to leave that to our written argument, unless the court has any questions about that. Thank you. Because fundamentally, this is governed by the Constitution, 111, 112. And Your Honor, that's the bottom line on the augmentation promise. It's the constitutional responsibility of Canada alone. But as I mentioned, there is the process duty, the duty arising from the honor of the crown. And you say Grassy Narrows has nothing to help us on this? Correct. Grassy Narrows is about division of powers. Mm -hmm. It's not about allocation of pre-confederation liabilities. Doesn't it help us understand that there are can be different emanations of the crown that the Anishinaabe didn't have to look to when they when they made a when they had an understanding with the crown they didn't have to distinguish as between which emanation of the crown owed their owed a fulfillment of that promise. So, Your Honor, I would respectfully say that might be an overreading of Grassy Narrows. Grassy Narrows is about division of powers, and to the extent that 
the different emanations of the crown have different legislative powers under 91 and 92 of the British North America Act. They exercise different authorities and have different responsibilities in respect of treaties. That's, that's fundamentally grasping arrows. And that was about the taking up provisions under the number of treaties. But fundamentally, grasping arrows doesn't deal with the question of pre-confederation liabilities. Pre-confederation liabilities are the subject of a carefully negotiated financial arrangement leading to the Constitution in 1867. Now, in terms of the duty of the, the honor of the Crown, I want to be clear that Ontario accepts that this duty applies to it. Ontario is subject to the honor of the Crown and the duty of diligent implementation. Any emanation of the Crown with a role to play in implementing a treaty is subject to this duty. But I mentioned, Your Honor, and I'm going to get into this in a bit more detail now, that the duty of diligent implementation is contextual. It's not a one-size-fits-all duty. Its content depends on the context. And that's in Manitoba Métis directly. It's at paragraph 83. It's in our compendium at tab one, but I don't need to pull it up. This court is familiar with Manitoba Métis. So the question we have to ask ourselves is what is the relevant context here? Canada has the obligation to augment and pay the annuities constitutionally, 111, 112. But Ontario has information that factors into the decision. So there are two crowns with different roles to play in the process. The emanation of the crown with the information that's Ontario, must provide it to the Crown with the obligation to augment and pay, that's Canada. And that's how Ontario has always understood its duty, going back to Premier and Attorney General Oliver Mowat. And the court heard evidence on that from Dr. Von Gurnett. I won't pull it up, but it's in our compendium at tab 14. Our page 77, lines 9 to 23. Thank you. Now, while I'm on the subject of the duty of diligent implementation, I want to be clear about three points. And the first arises from your honor's questions of my colleagues. I want to be clear that we're not saying that Ontario's duty is owed to Canada. Ontario must provide information to Canada, but it's not because of a right that Canada has. The duty of diligent implementation is owed to the First Nations. I'm glad for that clarification. And that's because it arises from the honor of the crown. It doesn't arise from any obligations between emanations of the crown. Second point that I want to be clear about is that Ontario's NCRR information is not the only information that Canada needs to consider when determining augmentations and payment obligations. Ontario's NCRR information is an important factor. There's no doubt about that, but there are, are others. And key here, and this arises from the Court of Appeal, key is the requirement to consider wealth and needs. You say that existed before the Ontario Court of Appeal decision? I believe the Court of Appeal was speaking about the common intentions in this, in this respect. Okay. So I don't, think, I don't think the Court of Appeal intended for the requirement to consider wealth and needs to arise as of 2021. I believe that was a statement in respect of how the augmentation promise was to be implemented. Okay. 
This is a paragraph 322 of Justice and Justice Lowers and Pardue's statement. I, don't, I won't pull it up. I'll just I'll just read it. The share promised is to be determined not only based on the extent of crown revenues, but also with reference to the relative wealth and needs of the different communities. So the extent of crown revenues, and that's both federal and provincial, that's one factor. Relative wealth is another factor. And needs, that's yet another factor. The share promise. You say the key requirement is a consideration of wealth and needs to interpret, to come to the common intention of the share promise? I say that's a key consideration in addition to the extent of crown revenues. Okay. My point is that Canada has a duty to collect all of this information. It's not just information from Ontario. Canada has to collect all this information, engage in a process of consultation with the First Nations, and then determine the level of sharing. And Canada must do this because Canada is the crown with the constitutional obligation to augment and pay the annuity. And Canada has not done that. Instead, more than 100 years ago, Canada signed away the right to get reimbursed by Ontario and Quebec. And after that, Canada stopped asking Ontario for this information. And Ontario could just go to sleep on that. Your Honor, Ontario provides revenue information in the public accounts and always has. No, I'm talking about go to sleep on the, any treaty obligation, any duty that is directed at the treaty. So, Your Honor, the way I'd answer that, first of all, I, I wouldn't say that Ontario could go to sleep in respect of the treaty. There's a, there are other provisions of the treaty. Ontario has obligations under the treaty. In this, in this particular context, when Canada is the one who has to determine the augmentation and the payments, Canada is really in the driver's seat here. And Canada did historically ask for information. I'm gonna go into some of the evidence in a moment where Canada did ask Ontario for information and Ontario did provide that information. We're talking a hundred years ago. We're talking a hundred years ago. We're talking two examples of a hundred years ago. I, 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 it's just that I've heard about them a lot. Yeah. And that's a hundred years ago. So it's, I, don't, I, I don't find it very responsive to the question about what did what does Ontario say about its obligation? Unless you're saying that for a hundred years and, and, and pointing at that time frame that, it, that for a hundred years, it didn't think it had to do anything if it didn't get a letter from Canada, which is how I have understood the arguments up till now. Yes, Your Honor. And, and that fundamentally is the way that Ontario has seen its duty since, as I mentioned, Oliver Mowat. But hmm. Canada needs to augment the annuity and Canada collects all this information. And again, it's not just Ontario information that factors into this. Critical is also what's the relative wealth, what are the needs? So Canada has to factor all this stuff in and Canada is not asking Ontario for this information. I, I just want you to help me. Would you say this is a new twist to the argument today? 
Like I wouldn't have perceived this to be the direction of the argument after reading the submissions. It's that's okay, but uh, actually, I... Your Honor, I, I I believe I'm tracking again like in, in a different order, but I believe I'm tracking to what we have in our materials. We start in our written argument with the idea that Canada and Canada alone is responsible. Yes. And then we get into Ontario's duties. And there we distinguish between obligations arising from the honor of the crown versus obligations arising from the augmentation promise. And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm highlighting those aspects. Okay. Your Honor mentioned that the court has heard quite a bit about the historical episodes. So I won't get into that in a lot of detail. I'll just note for your honor that paragraphs uh, or rather tabs 14 to 16 of our compendium volume four remedies contains evidence in respect of three of those historical episodes. Tab 14 is 1873 to 1874 leading up to the first and only augmentation. Ontario provided information directly from Oliver Mowat Tab 15, that's 1875 to 1879 about arrears. Again, Canada provided, or rather Ontario provided detailed information. And then tab 16 relates to the statutory arbitrations and the Ontario information provided in that context. Sorry, are you looking at your compendium? I, I, I'm not. Tabs 14, 15, and 16 appear to be transcript excerpts. That's right, Your Honor. These are transcripts from Dr. Von Garnett. Oh, so you're not sending me to documents. Thank you. Yes, Your Honor. So the way that this is organized, we have the transcript evidence from Dr. Von Garnett as the primary evidence. And then behind that, we have demonstrative slide slides. Very good. Just for Your Honor's assistance. Now, a point I want to make about this is... When the court goes through that evidence, the court will see that there were delays and the court heard evidence from Dr. Von Gernet about that. And we admit that. The reality is that these episodes took place in the early days of the Federation and correspondence literally got lost in the shuffle. And Dr. Von Gernet gave us that evidence. And I'll just make the point, which the court is familiar with that the duty of diligent implementation doesn't require perfection. And that's paragraph 82. Now, the final point that I wanted to make about the process duty, Your Honor, relates to the question of remedy. Even if the court finds that Ontario's historical conduct was dishonorable, failures in the process duty per se don't ground a financial remedy. Breach of the augmentation promise might and I'm gonna come back to that in more detail because we say that there's an alternative based on declarations and arrears payments. I'm gonna talk about that. But the point is that the remedy in respect of the augmentation promise, that cures the financial implications of the breach. Failures in the process duty, delayed payment for 170 years, that's clear. But delays in the payment of the annuities, as best as can be made up for by money, and I emphasize as best for, those can be addressed by interest. Ontario should be responsible for the interest? No, Your Honor, because fundamentally it was Canada's obligation to augment and pay the annuities. Now, sorry, uh, let me just see if I followed the argument. If there's a, if there's a, uh, a failure in the process duty that causes delay, delay can be made up for an in interest. It will be made up for by interest by Canada as the crown entity, which has the constitutional obligation to pay the annuities. Canada can't shift that to Ontario. Now, Your Honor, I, I wanna be clear about a point and this arises, I believe in a question Your Honor asked of Ms. Evans, I'm not saying that money and interest can fully 
rectify a rift in the treaty relationship. There's still a role for declaratory relief to identify and call out historical breaches of the honor of the crown. Those are meaningful remedies. And every case thus far, finding a breach of the duty of diligent implementation has gone down that road. Manitoba Métis is a great example of that. It's also the case in Yahi in British Columbia, the Treaty 8 case that Mr. Schachter, my friend Mr. Schachter, went through, I guess, two weeks ago now. There's no precedent for the duty of diligent implementation on its own giving rise to financial remedies. And there's no reason for this case to be different because we have the augmentation promise and that grounds a financial outcome. Here, I'll move to the question of breach of the augmentation promise and the remedies that follow therefrom. And this is in our main written submissions, paragraphs uh, 327 to 358. 357 to... My apologies, Your Honor, 327 to 358. Thank you. First point is to state the obvious. The annuity has not been augmented in a diligent manner, at least not since 1875. But the questions here are, which crown is responsible and what's the appropriate remedy? And the crown is Canada, I've already laid that out in our submission. So now I'm addressing what remedy should follow against Canada for failing to augment the annuity. And we say that a declaration or series of declarations reviewing the Crown's implementation proposals would be the most appropriate remedy. In this area of the law, Your Honor, declarations are powerful. Get this, even with respect to what you say is Canada's breach, you say a series of declarations would be the most appropriate remedy, right. not a financial remedy. Correct, Your Honor. And from the declarations, arrears payments may well follow. For example, before the court, there are a series of debates over questions like, do you include spectrum? How do you deal with the time value of money? This court can work out those issues and then put it to the parties to negotiate and determine arrears payments, the way arrears were paid in 1903 with interest. Your Honor, I want to spend a moment on the power of declarations and that's- what, what would have been the value of all of the economic evidence called over the last six months, which was called by Ontario as well and with Ontario's um, serious and I am sure sincere engagement in a case management process that put before this court highly detailed economic evidence. When you say, I think you're saying this case should have been argued on theory only with declarations and then told the parties to gather their economic experts and sit in a room and negotiate. Your Honor, I think one of the lessons that we can draw from the evidence the courts heard is that theory needs details. It's difficult to talk in abstract about things like spectrum without the details. It's impossible to talk about things like forestry management expenses without understanding what those numbers look like. So the, the, the debates that have been put before the court in respect of these questions, they required all that economic evidence in my submission.
I wanted to take the court quickly to the Yahi case, which Mr. Schachter had spent time in the other week. And this is in our compendium at tab nine. And I wanted to take the court to paragraph 1874. This is where Justice Burke writes that declarations can be powerful tools in litigation involving governments as it is assumed the governments will comply with both the letter and spirit of the declaration. Declarations offer remedial flexibility and are taken seriously by governments. And Your Honor, the primary reason why we say here a declaration is the most appropriate remedy has to do with the significant discretion that the Crown has in implementing the augmentation promise. And I appreciate that the augmentation promise is mandatory. That was this court's finding at stage one, but there's still significant discretion in the details, including the level of the sharing, which has to take into account wealth and needs. The common intention in 1850 was to share. That's this court's finding, but it wasn't to fix percentages of sharing. The ethno historians in this trial agreed there was no common intention to fix specific percentage formula. Dr. Dribben told us that it's in our compendium at tab 10. I don't need to pull it up. The import is this, it's not possible to ground a percentage share, like an 84%, for example, in the common intention of 1850. Sharing is the output of a process that balances all the inputs, including wealth and needs. So the court ought to review the Crown's implementation proposals in the trial, including the approach to compound interest and evaluate the reasonableness. And if the court determines that the Crown requires further directions regarding how to implement arrears payments, then declarations can provide direction. It's a meaningful remedy that also preserves the Crown's significant discretion under the treaty. But we say respectfully that the court shouldn't step into the shoes of the Crown to craft an implementation proposal of its own choosing. Well, do you say the Crown steps into the shoes of the Crown if it fixes sharing or if it assesses compensation? So I'm gonna come into the whole question of assessing compensation versus calculating damages in a moment, um, but- So I'm just gonna ask you to consider what I understand to be Canada's opinion, yes. which is take the evidence, the economic evidence of calculations of NCRRs, take the evidence on time value of money and bring forward values and make an assessment. Canada says, that's not stepping into the crown shoes. You don't have to make those specific determinations on transportation expenses or forestry expenses or uh, how to characterize revenues, nor the 8416 or 58 something else model, but making it having considered all of that, make an assessment. Do you say that as well is inappropriate because it steps into the crown's shoes? Your Honor, I, 
I have to respectfully disagree with my friends for Canada in that respect. We have a legal issue about whether it's assessment. I'm going to come to that later, but to address your question more specifically right now, it does, we say, step into the crown's shoes to determine how much of resource revenues to share. And whether you call it an assessment or you call it a damages calculation or whatever it is, there is still embedded within that a determination of how much to share as a percentage. And we say that is supposed to be subject to a process between the Crown and the First Nations. And it's subject, if there is no consensus reached, to significant Crown discretion. And for the court to step into that relationship, we say, is not the way that a remedy should follow. And I'm going to address the alternative position if it's a financial remedy, of course, but that is our primary position, that the right thing to do is declarations reviewing the Crown proposals, solve the debates before the court, is spectrum in or out, that sort of thing, but not to determine a share. Now, this is my last question, so I let you go on with your argument, but I have one more, and that is, if I understand your argument, you're saying what the court should do now is make a, a series of declarations, which, which are directive to the Crown to engage in a process with guidelines. And then the Crown's will, as you say, have those debates. One might call them negotiations, which this court and the Court of Appeal have been urging upon the parties in the history of this case, but that the Supreme Court of Canada has been urging upon the Crown for some long time. And those urgings have not brought any meaningful satisfaction to the First Nations in this case. Why should they wait one more second? Aren't courts for the purpose of resolving intractable disputes if the parties cannot come to a resolution within some meaningful time? So, Your Honor, I would agree with that proposition you just made, that the court's role is to resolve intractable disputes. And the parties have put before the court numerous intractable disputes. Do we include spectrum? How do you deal with the time value of money? Forestry expenses, that sort of thing. These are things that the parties need assistance in respect of, and they've put before the court. And I'm not saying the court can't resolve those debates. That's why the parties are here. What I'm saying is that the final step needs to be through a process between the parties, not a determination of a share, a percentage share by the court. Is that, is that your biggest problem, the share percentage? That's that the court should not touch that question. It's hard to determine relative sizes of concerns, Your Honor, but, but I would, what I would say is that that is- it's the biggest number. It, 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 it is a very significant issue in this case. And you can see that, Your Honor, in, in respect of the numbers which have been presented, obviously it's big numbers, all of that. But at the end of the day, we have to look back at common intention. We always have to ground this exercise in this room in the common intention. And the common intention was not to fix percentage shares in 1850. Subject other questions from Your Honor and Madam, I'll move to our, our alternative position in respect of a financial award. And there's a few minutes before the break, so I can frame up the debate, see if I can narrow the issues a little bit, and then we can get into the meat of it after the break, perhaps. The debate here, Your Honor, is over the governing principles. And there are, on my count, three options on the table. You say over government prin governing principles? Governing principles. Thank you. The three options on the table are Ontario's position 
that the common law of expectation damages applies. The plaintiff says that principles from equitable compensation should inform the remedy. And I believe they frame this as a sui generis approach, but it draws very heavily on equitable compensation principles. And then Canada offers an alternative sui generis approach of their own. Also drawing on principles of equitable compensation and common law. Some, but not all, Your Honor. Right. And I'm going to come into why we don't we don't see that as being a viable alternative. But but what I do want to start with is some areas of common ground that I see between the parties. First point of agreement is we agree with our friends that this is largely a question of first impression. There are some old cases. We mention them in our materials but they don't contain a detailed discussion on how remedial principles apply in this circumstance. For us, Your Honor, what that means is that we need to engage in reasoning by analogy. It's a novel case, we need to look to analogy, and that's gonna be a theme of my submissions, reasoning by analogy. Second point of agreement, it's common ground, I believe, that the remedy should follow from and be responsive to the breach. And I'll set out how that principle is reflected in the common law approach to expectation damages. Go ahead. The third point of agreement is that I agree with my friends that regardless of the remedial framework, the objective is always to achieve a just remedy. But in our submission, we need to be clear on what the governing principles are. And that's where my friends and I differ somewhat. Do you say when you say that regardless of remedial framework, and you say this is point of agreement, that a just remedy must be achieved, do you say, or do you agree, I believe, with the characterization made possibly by Canada, that this is, in, in fashioning that remedy, one must not be stuck by or constrained by labels of remedies that when you look by analogy or when the court looks by analogy it is looking to what is achieved by the remedy not what it was called do you uh, uh, do you take exception to that what i understand to be that submission your honor the way that you put it i would agree with there's actually a tendency in the law where equity and common law are concerned about the same things for the remedies to converge, mm -hmm. right? So it's not, it's not based on labels. And the case that Ms. Crew reviewed in detail, the Kansan Enterprises case, is a great example of that. And I believe the majority decision from Justice Laforet says that almost expressly. It's not about labels, it's about just remedies. But what I'm gonna get into is that when you look at the principles that exist out there in the law, the closest, analogy is to common law expectation damages. It deals with promises. That's the closest analogy. The common law is telling us what a just remedy looks like in that context. And I'll lay out why it is that the principles drawn from equitable compensation, it's not a close analogy and they don't have a role to play. And that's fundamentally where we disagree with the approach of the plaintiffs. 
equitable compensation has no role to play absent a fiduciary duty. And, but when you say that, what are you saying about equitable compensation? That it's a label and that anything that falls within that label doesn't fit because it has that label or there's something else about it? Yes, Your Honor, I'm gonna get into the something else for okay. sure. As a matter of fact, after the break, I'm gonna take the court through the history of where equitable compensation comes from, mm -hmm. why it applies to fiduciary duties, and I'm going to set out why that analogy that the court drew in Gurin between trust law and fiduciary duties does not apply here, right? There is a principled approach to where equitable principles are instructive. It's in Whitefish Lake. I'm going to take the court through that. But that principled approach is instructive here to say that actually we should be in the common law expectation world, not the equitable compensation world. So it's not about labels, it's about the principles that underlie these doctrines, where they come from, and how close are the analogies. So, Your Honor, I see it's 11.20, I believe that's... A... Is this a good spot for you to break? This is a good spot, Your Honor, because I'm going to get into that deeper dive after the break. Thank you. We'll take the break now. Then. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. This court is to down for fifteen minutes. Order, all rise. This court is resumed. Please be seated. Your Honor, where we left off, I was indicating that I was going to get into a deeper dive into the remedial principles. So that's where we are. I'm going to start with the common law. Thank you. In our written materials, we discuss the common law framework starting at paragraph 477. And then in our reply at paragraph 87. Thank you. Common law expectation damages developed as part of contract law. And I want to be very clear about the analogy that I'm drawing, because this analogy is not to diminish treaties as contracts. Treaties are not contracts. I accept this court's finding at stage two that the differences between treaties and contracts are profound, and that's a quote from this court at paragraph um, 145. We also accept the Supreme Court's description of treaties as sacred. And I'll briefly address what that means. In our compendium from tabs 25 through 29, we include the cases we could find where the Supreme Court described treaties as sacred. First of these cases is the Siwi case. Then there's Badger. In both Siwi and Badger, the court uses the language of sacred in the context of describing the invaluable nature of treaties. In Siwi, it was about the strict requirements for extinguishment. In Badger, it was about the strict requirements for amendment. And there I was talking about the natural resources transfer agreement. 
in the Constitution Act 1930, and that's a paragraph 47. I don't need to pull it up. The first one was invaluable. Invaluable, yeah. That's that's not the word from the Supreme Court. They said sacred. I'm saying that's how I interpret what the court's referring to, the unbreakable nature yes. of treaties. Inviolable. 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 Mr. Gover has corrected my pronunciation. <laughs> Spell correct was not accepting it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a strong sign, man. Now, this idea of treaties as being not to be broken, I'm not gonna attempt my pronunciation again. <laughs> That's picked up in Badger, and then in Sundown, and in Miccosu Cree 2018 as an interpretive principle. And as an interpretive principle, the language of sacred captures the great respect and reverence that treaties deserve and require. And that's what sacred, we say, means in the vocabulary of the Supreme Court. But many of these same cases, including Badger, draw analogies where appropriate between treaties and contracts for the purpose of identifying what legal principles should apply. It's a matter of analogy. Badger says that expressly. It's a paragraph 76. Treaties are analogous to contracts, albeit of a very solemn and special public nature. They create enforceable obligations based on the mutual consent of parties. The common law has a well-developed framework to address the financial implications where there's a breach of enforceable obligations based on the mutual consent of parties. It's called expectation damages. And we say that's the closest analogy for a case like this where financial remedies are sought. To support that, Your Honor, I'm going to take the court into the leading case from the Supreme Court of Canada on how expectation damages work. Okay, just let me catch up, please. Yes. The case, Your Honor, is at tab six of our compendium, and that's the Bank of America case that Mr. Marcello mentioned. Ms. Evans referenced this case as well. Thank you. This is a contract case, but it provides a great primer on how expectation damages rectify breached promises. And it also highlights the flexibility that is inherent in the common law. And I'll pick this up at paragraph 26, a decision of the Supreme Court of Canada, Justice Major. Justice Major writes, generally, Courts employ expectation damages where, if breach is proved, the plaintiff will be entitled to the value of the promised performance. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Then there's a reference to the late Professor Wadham's The Law of Damages. The key thing to note here is that expectation damages are determined based on the date of the breach. The idea is based on expectations. What was expected in terms of the promised performance? The plaintiff's expectation losses are then calculated and then the damages are brought forward into present dollars to compensate for the passage of time. So what was expected at the date of the breach, bring that forward into present dollars so that the benefit of the bargain is achieved. And do you say we can use expectation and common intention interchangeably? When you say expectation on the date of the promise? Yes, Your Honor, because when the courts speak about expectation, it's the objective expectation of the promise. And in the context of treaties, we speak about common intention. So I'd say yes. So the point I'd like to make about this quickly and to bring it back to what Mr. Marcello spoke about this morning, the way that the Bodeway smart approach to annuitization works is exactly this. It determines what an annuity would look like in every given year, and it brings it forward to present dollars. Sorry, is this the risk adjusted one? No, Your Honor. So the Bodeway Smart Approach, the way it fundamentally works is it's to take NCRR information yes. and convert that into an annuity. So the NCRRs go into a notional capital account, then that generates interest at the band trust account rates, those interest payments get paid out as an annual annuity. What, what has been referred to as the annuity machine. The annuity machine, exactly. What it is fundamentally is the annuitization of NCRRs. And you say that that concept, which is not, which took some explaining, was an expectation around that Treaty Council fire? What I'm saying, Your Honor, is that when we use the common law approach, our question is, what was expected? Bring that forward to present dollars. And what we're saying about the uh, Bodeway Smart approach is that what that does is it determines how much of an annuity ought to have been paid out every year, then it brings it forward to present dollars. And to answer your question, Your Honor, about what was expected in the common intention in 1850, I would say that the common intention in 1850 was the annuitization of, of the sharing. The sharing is through annuitization. And we see that in the language of the treaty, it talks about an annuity. We see that in some of the evidence reviewed at stage one as well, about the idea that one would take the, the mining revenues and pay out interest payments on them. Mm -hmm. We also see that in the land fund model, the historical analog, interest payments on a notional capital account. What we're saying fundamentally is that this is how annuitization works, how it worked historically as well. And when we're applying the common law expectation approach, the question we have to ask ourselves is what was expected in every, every given year? And the answer to that question is an annuity. And then we have to bring that forward into present dollars, the way that Bank of America instructs us to do that. Justice Major discusses the bring forward analysis in paragraphs 28 and 29. I'm not gonna read through that. The key point is as I've been laying out that the court determines the value of the expectation. So this, I'm just trying to go back to this smart and bodeway approach. So the, an annuity is calculated in any particular year, let's take 1900. And in 1900, that calculated amount go into account. 
and you say your this approach is premised on a high degree, a continued high degree of control over the money. So as opposed to just a payout. Your Honor, I might distinguish a few things here, or like maybe unpack this a little bit. Okay. The, the, okay. the idea of control over the money, that's getting to the question of how do we bring that forward into present dollars? No, I, not for my question. Okay. My question is in 1900, the year that there's a calculation of an annuity yes. or of a, of let's call it NCRRs or let's call it something, all right? There's a calculation of an amount in 1900. Correct. Right. And you say that instead of that money being distributed to the chiefs, it is put in an account. So actually, Your Honor, it's a little bit different from that. Okay. So the way that the Bodeway Smart Approach annuitizes is it takes the NCRRs, it puts that in a notional capital account, right? right. There's nothing actually going into a bank account. It's a notional right. it's account. A, it's a, it's a yeah. bookkeeping entry. Exactly. And then what it does is it says, at the band trust account rates, how much interest is paid out of that notional account? So I understand that. That's the annuity. That is premised, that idea that there's a bookkeeping entry and then there's a, a, a bookkeeping entry for interest, that that idea is premised on this high amount of crown control of the money, that the crown maintains control of that money and does not pay it out in 1900. So actually, Your Honor, it's, that's the next step of both of voting smart approach, right? So it calculates the annuity. I just want you to work with me for a second. It presumes it's not paid out in 1900. See, actually, Your Honor, I, I wouldn't agree with that. Okay. So then the second part of that question is, if it's not, if it is, you, it's, there's a bookkeeping uh, entry for it. And I, my, if I understand you correctly, that's because the government or the crown is working on annuitizing that 1900, the year 1900 amount. Yes, your honor. So the annuity is calculated through the band trust account rates, right? Then we have an annuity. And then the question is, where does that annuity go? And I think this is responsive to your honor's question. Under the Bodeway Smart Approach, it's consistent with the annuity being paid out to the to the bands, because what Bodeway Smart do is they say, once once it, we reach the point that we know what the annuity is for the year, then we use the bond rate as the risk free rate to bring that forward into present dollars, not the band trust account rate, right? So it's not based on this idea that the money all just stays in an account. Right. Bodeway Smart's approach is actually not that at all. It's that once you work out what the annuity is then that goes to the bands and then the bands are should be compensated for the time value of that money and that's how the um but in money or in an, a bookkeeping entry um no your honor so the, the bring forward analysis is really more about how do you calculate the damages fundamentally and the answer to that is we have to say what is the time value of the money so Bank of America tells us in paragraphs 28, 29, we use the risk-free rate, it's the bond rate. So it's not based on a, on a notion of control at that point. The notion of control, the way that comes into the argument is to say, that's one of the answers to the 60-40 approach because that's not a realistic rate. One of the answers, so there's lots of answers, but that's one of the answers. But Bodeway Smart is not based on an idea of control. Well, I thought under the Bodeway Smart approach that if in the year 1901, for instance, there was no increase, then the bookkeeping of that year would take an annuity payment from the interest of another year and apply it. So, Your Honor, the way that it works is every year an amount is added to this notional account. An amount. If, a, did, a, in, a, an amount. amount? Some, like either, like, and they give four, four options, but in one of the options is 100% of NCRs. Yes. Right. So, what you do is you take what are the NCRs? You add that to the notional account. If you're adding money to the notional account, then 
the annuity increases because you multiply the band trust account rate by the notional account. So you've augmented the annuity. You've added to the notional account. The annuity that's spit out every given year is going to go up. If the amount you're adding to the notional account is negative, then that brings down the notional capital account. And then every year going forward, it's going to be slightly less than the annuity. Now I remember where I got yeah. stuck. So this approach presumes that money was never paid. And we now have a bookkeeping exercise 170 years later. And so annuities can go down, annuities can go up. But it doesn't presume it was ever paid out. Well, Your Honor. But in 1900, whatever was there was paid. And in 1902, if there was no money, nothing was paid. Well, always the minimum gets paid under their model. But the, right. no, no increased. Yeah, exactly. So, so the way that it works fundamentally, Your Honor, is what gets paid out is the interest payment on the notional account. You add more to the notional account, more gets paid out as the annuity. You add, there's less in the notional capital account, less gets paid out as the annuity. So it's asking the question, how much would have been paid out every given year? And that is- My question is, would the full sum, not just the interest, would the Crown not have been obliged to pay, as per the treaty language, to the chiefs that amount? So you're saying, would- they... let, the, let the First Nations deal with the interest. Well, Your Honor, that's not an annuitization, right? So what that would be is direct, direct payments of NCRRs. And we say that's not consistent with the treaty language, which calls for an annuity. The way historically, the only analogs we have historically for how things were annuitized was what I'm describing. You put money into an account, interest gets paid out, that gets paid out every year. It's not a direct amount of NCRs that are, that are paid out, it's rather an annuitization on that amount. And what that does fundamentally is it smooths out the payments. So it's instead of highs and lows every given year, maybe there's a lot one year, not a lot next year, when you do the annuitization formula, right. then what you're doing is you're saying it goes into the capital account. If the amount goes up in the capital account, then you're going to get a little bit more in terms of the interest payment that comes out, goes down a little bit less, but it's smooth. Right. I'm recalling now the troubles I had with this when the evidence was put in. So let's say up until, I don't know, 1950, there were significant credits in this, what you call notional account. Yes. And then for whatever reason, how the resources were managed or how the resources responded to market pressure, there were no positive amounts. So the First Nations would have got zero, or not, sorry, not zero. The First Nations would have only been accessing or uh, accessing interest up till then. Mm. And as a result of this change in the economy, they would get decreasing amounts, but they would never have had the full benefit of those good years. They would never have had that because those good years would have been under this model financing what Ontario says are the bad years, to the point of, as, as I recall the evidence, to the point of zero. We're at one percent, or and less than one percent every year, in this continuing trend. So, Your Honor, I just want to be clear that the one percent—that's risk adjustment. That's a whole. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It, but yeah, continue to decrease because the good years would have been held back to produce an interest. Correct. It, like it basically, it's it's a it's a corpus up that upon which interest is paid, and if there's bad years that are negative, that might bring that down. So the corpus I, down. So I, I just want to go back to common intention. So you say that this model is based on a on a common intention that the First Nations wanted, understood, and agreed that that money would be held back, that the capital of the annuities would be held back from their control or their access. So the, the capital in that notional amount, yeah. and then they get the annuity payments. Mm -hmm. out. But what I'm that saying is, is, it, is it based on that yeah, well, assumption? 
Sort of, Your Honor, but what I'd say is that the historical analog here is the land fund model, which is exactly how that worked, right? So you have a sale of land and that goes into a notional account and then an interest payment is paid out every given year. So what you've done is you've taken that lump sum at the beginning and you've, you've annuitized it over time. But the lump sum is not comparable to uh, share of resources. It's a fixed sum. It goes in, you get the interest on it. Precisely. And that's how augmentation... And everyone would... Un that, that's easy to understand. If you're right. at, the, at the treaty fire, we're going to sell your land for $10 a parcel. It's going to generate, generate interest. You get the interest. But, we were but at this treaty fire, we were talking about an unknown. Yeah. Unknown. So what we're fun what it, the way it fundamentally works is to say that as time goes on, if the land is productive, then we add more to that notional account and the interest payments go up. You've augmented the annuity. You know, so you take the revenues from the given year, net revenues, it's positive. You add that to the notional capital account that generates a higher annuity payment. You've augmented the annuity. So I'd submit that, that it's, it's the same model. The only idea that's different is the notion of adding to that capital amount to augment. But the capital amount is never paid under this model. The capital amount is not paid under the model because what you've done is you've spread, spread it out over time, fundamentally. Same thing with the land fund model. You've spread it out over time. Rather than a lump sum payment at the beginning, you've spread it out by paying interest on it. It's the same thing here. That creates a smooth stream where you don't have that peaks and valleys over time. Smooth stream of annuities that will gradually go up. And if there's negative years, it might gradually go down. But every year is not going to be massively different from the last year. It's annuitization. So, Your Honor, before we got into the Bodeway Smart Approach, I was reviewing the Bank of America case. And the other point I wanted to make from Bank of America was about compounding. Prior to Bank of America, the common law didn't accept compound interest. It was considered to be usury historically. Bank of America changes that. It shows that the common law is flexible. And fundamentally, the court says to get the benefit of the bargain in a world of inflation, we can compound. And that's what the court deals with at paragraph 38. And in this case, all of the experts for the crowns are accepting compounding. Even though the common law didn't accept that until 2002. And that's a testament to the flexibility of the common law approach to get the benefit of the bargain and the promised performance. So the key point here is that the common law takes into account the plaintiff's expectations in terms of a promised performance. It takes into account the timeliness of the performance and it takes into account the time value of money. I, I just want to clarify one thing, please. Yes. Uh, you say all the experts uh, accept that it should be compounding. Do you say all the, that the crowns are? I, I can is. You say Ontario. Yeah, Ontario's experts compound. Not Ontario's experts, but, but Ontario accepts that. Oh, we accept that. We, we're, we're accepting compound. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead. So, Your Honor, that's the common law expectation approach drawn drawn from analogy. And what, what I wanted to turn to next was my friend's argument that principles from equitable compensation should inform the remedy. And that point is addressed in our main submissions, starting at paragraph 486. Paragraph again. Four, eight, six. Thank you. 
Your Honor, given the submissions we've heard on this subject, what I thought would be useful is a little bit of a drill down on what equitable compensation is and where it comes from. And in our compendium at tab two, we have an extract from the Medow and McCamus text, the law of restitution. I'm not gonna read through all this. What I'll do is I'll commend to the court a careful look at where equitable compensation comes from and I'll give the key points. The key takeaway is that equitable compensation arises from trust law. It was basically a substitute for a proprietary interest. So if trust law couldn't restore the property in specie, equity might compensate for its value instead. That's, that's fundamentally where it comes from. And I'll just note the Supreme Court talks a bit about that history in Southwind itself, paragraph 68. This um, extract we've included at tab two is a bit of a deeper dive. But a few things arise from that that matter for this case. Equitable compensation as a remedy is considered to be restitutionary. It's all about restoring the value of property to an estate, originally in trust law. And that's why it is that we talk about equitable compensation as being an assessment. It's assessed at the date of the trial. It's like we're assessing the, the value of property at the date of the trial. And the reason originally was because the court of equity, the court of chancery couldn't return the property. So they asked today, what is that property worth? Let's assess that value. And that was also why equity wasn't concerned about foreseeability. So the question was, what's the property worth today? The fact that the property values increased exponentially, for example, that wasn't equity's concern. Because the question was today, what is this property worth? And that's where this idea of the benefit of hindsight comes in, in trust law. It's all about assessing the value of property at the date of the trial. And it was only later that equitable compensation expanded outside of that original trust law context into fiduciary duty law. And that's the significance of a number of the cases that Ms. Crew referred to last week, like Durham, Canton Enterprises. These are cases of non-trustee fiduciary duties. And the Supreme Court of Canada basically analogized between fiduciary duties and trust law, specifically between trust-like cases and true trust cases. That was originally where it comes from. And then they eventually say, trust-like, exactly, trust-like cases. And eventually they say, well, let's not focus too much on the true trust versus trust-like. But the point is, it was a case of reasoning by analogy. And the analogy was to trust law. So the basic question for us today is how close is that original analogy? The remedy started in trust law, it expanded into non-trustee fiduciary duties. And the question is, do we expand that by analogy yet again into a new context? And my answer is no. The principles don't support the leap. And I acknowledge- There's Another way to look at it that trust law and fiduciary duties both have relationships as their central focus. And that that relationship is distinguished from what has been called an ordinary mercantile transaction. And so when you are looking at the principles and analogies, isn't one of the key considerations, the nature of the relationship? So your honor, it is definitely the case that fiduciary duties focus on relationships. Trust law focuses on relationships. The submission that I will make is that 
and I'm going to dive into some case law on this in a moment, White Fish Lake. But the submission that I'll make is that the analogy to trust like cases was actually based more on stewardship of property and less on the relationship aspect. It was about stewardship of a proprietary or property-like interest. So in a case like Gurren, for example, it wasn't a true trust because the way that the Crown's relationship to reserve land is, it couldn't be a true trust, but it was trust-like. It was a property interest. It was stewardship of the property. And I'll take the court right into Whitefish Lake to make this point. Okay, just yeah. one more yeah. thing that I, you can blend it into your submissions, possibly have it there is section 35 and defining relationships and obligations and going back to your word sacred, which is how this promise has been described and the nature of sacred seems to me to have uh, links and threads to relationship promises, as in ongoing. They don't end at the time of the signing of the deal. So go ahead. Yeah, so Your Honor, I'm, I'm going to make, I'm going to develop this point in Whitefish Lake, but just to respond to the court's question about relationship promises, I'll just point out that there, it isn't the case that all contracts are mercantile in nature. Like there are relationship contracts, employment contracts are relationship contracts. So the very idea of a relationship, that's not what is engaging equity, right? What, what equity is more concerned about is, and originally was only concerned about really in trust law, was about the stewardship of property. And I want to be clear, it's property-like interests as well, because we see that in Gurren. Right. So the question is, do we have an analogy to something property like? And my submission here is that that's not the case when it comes to an annuity. It might be the case in a different treaty context when we're talking about reserve land or something along those lines. I made it so far. Not bad. <laughs> So your honor, but I think the passes are over. <laughs> yes, I'll slow down. Your honor, the Whitefish Lake case is at tab three. Thank you. And I, I believe the court has been referred to this numerous times now. So just a very brief reminder of the context. This was a case of a fiduciary duty involving timber rights. And it's the decision of Justice Sharp from the Court of Appeal. And Justice Sharp lays out a principled approach for where equitable compensation is going to be engaged. And I'll just make the point in response to your honor's questions. This is also in the tab three. Uh, I did, yes, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's at the top, sorry. I'm just looking at the top and it looked like the textbook, but this is uh, Whitefish, thanks. Uh, yes, you're right, Your Honor, because the top of the page cites the text I just mentioned. Right, but it's Whitefish and this is uh, Justice Sharp. Justice Sharp. Thank you. Okay, in paragraph. Paragraph 51, Your Honor. Thank you. And of course, this is a, a case involving Section 35 interests as well and that relationship. So we should look to, to the principled approach that Justice Sharp laid out. And this starts at paragraph 51. He writes, in my view, this is an appropriate case to award equitable compensation. Your Honor, I've been saying Justice Sharp. I meant Justice Laskin. That that was a complete. I was wondering. <laughs> yes, <laughs> my apologies, Your Honor. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Noga. So, Your Honor, paragraph fifty-one. In my view, this is an appropriate case to award equitable compensation. Modern jurisprudence of the Supreme Court of Canada has emphasized that remedies for breaches of fiduciary duty should be flexible, and this is the key point. Not every breach of fiduciary duty attracts the remedy of equitable compensation. So even in the fiduciary duty context, we're not automatically in the world of equitable compensation. There's a principled approach. Down at paragraph 53, 
Justice Laskin writes under Canson. And of course, that's Canson Enterprises, which Ms. Crude took us through. Under Canson, when a fiduciary who has discretionary control of a beneficiary's property uh, breaches its duty to the beneficiary, an award of equitable compensation is justified. And then this is unpacked at paragraph 54. In his majority judgment in Canson, Justice Lafore drew a distinction, a sharp divide between two classes of fiduciary duties. In one class are cases where the property in question belongs to the beneficiary, but is controlled by the fiduciary. In the other class are cases where the fiduciary is merely required to perform its duty honestly and in accordance with its undertaking. And what I'm about to read is the key point, Your Honor. Justice LaForay stressed that these two classes of cases engage different policy objectives. Only the first class of cases, where the fiduciary controls the property of the beneficiary, and equity's concern is to compensate for what the property would be worth, should equity use its well-recognized flexibility to achieve a different and fairer result. This is engaging with where I started the analogy to trust law, where equitable compensation comes from. And the different result that Justice Laskin is referring to is asking, what is the value of the property? What would it be worth at the date of the trial? As opposed to restoring the expectation of a promise. And in my submission, this is the principled approach. So you say here, uh, you say in, in the present case, the Crown controlled the property and therefore the equities concern is to compensate what the property would be worth. So your honor, if, if by this case, you mean Whitefish Lake, I'd agree with that. No, not Whitefish Lake. Yes, I, I thought that was where you were going, your honor, because what I'd say about that is that the Crown doesn't control a property-like interest here. Annuities are not property in specie. No, I'm not talking about controlling the annuities. I'm talking about exploiting the land. But the treaty gave the Crown control over the land. Yes, Your Honor, but the, the interest here in the Augmentation Clause is not about that discretionary control over the land. But it arises from the, the, the promise to pay is linked to the decisions made with respect to the land and the obligation of the crown to manage the land or the understanding, the expectation that they were managing the land. The, the, resources, selling yeah. it, exploiting it, licensing it, timbering it. Isn't that controlling the property of the beneficiary? So your honor, what I would say about that is that what we should be focused on is the interest that is embedded in the augmentation clause itself. And the interest embedded in the augmentation promise is about the payment of an annuity, which always was paid out of the CRF. It wasn't property paid in specie. And the reason why that matters is because we're not engaged in a circumstance where the question is, well, what would that property have been worth 170 years later, right? Because that's fundamentally what Justice Laskin is talking about here. Right, so we're not talking about a trust corpus. We're not talking about reserve land where we can look, well, how much, how much is this reserve land worth in 2023? It's a different question. So we have to be focused on the actual interest at play. And 
I would submit that the reason why this court didn't find a sui generis fiduciary duty in this case is the same point. When you say focus on the interest embedded in the augmentation promise, you say focus on the legal interest in the embedded, not, not the money interest. The legal interest, I think that's fair. So this is all to say, Your Honor, that the stronger analogy in our submission is to the common law of expectations, perfor promised performance. We're not on the side of that sharp divide that Justice Laskin laid out in Whitefish Lake. There's no fiduciary duty at all. There is no sui generis fiduciary duty, but the analogy that was drawn in Gurin to trust law, that doesn't apply here. We should focus on promised performance. And that's the common law approach. And what do you say to the, to the uh, Court of Appeals um, point that equity has no work to do here? Was that not in response to, we need, we need to find a fiduciary duty or a fiduciary duty allows the finding of equitable remedies and um, the majority saying you can find equitable like remedies in any event here. It, I, I don't have the words before me, of course, but there was no suggestion that, that the court in considering stage three was limited to common law remedies. Your Honor, I'm not saying that the Court of Appeal restricted that. I would make the point that and this is sort of like the recent Sogin case. The Court of Appeal in this case was not dealing with remedies questions, right? And where, where the court made that comment about the work to be done, the way I interpret that is fundamentally that the, the broader concept from earlier jurisprudence about this broad fiduciary relationship that concept has been effectively replaced by the honor of the crown because it was fundamentally what that concept imported was a requirement of honor. So we have this, we have this more modern doctrine, the honor of the crown. And that is what is um, engaged in a case like this without having to find a sui generis fiduciary duty, which isn't applicable or an ad hoc fiduciary duty. <laughs> But I don't, I don't in, in, interpret the court as saying, and therefore equitable compensation applies. I don't think they were addressing that. Well, weren't they saying that equitable principles of equitable remedies apply? They weren't saying we don't need to find fiduciary duty because we have this new modern doctrine of honor of the crown. Therefore, you're limited to common law remedies. Well, Your Honor, I'm not saying that they said you're limited to common law remedies. What I'm saying is like, they left that open for this court in stage three to determine what the remedies should be. And I'm making the submission that the right analogy to follow is the way the common law has always dealt with promised performance. The Court of Appeal didn't prejudge the question to say that equitable compensation therefore applies in my submission. which segues into the recent uh, Saugeen First Nation case, because I would submit that the same thing's happening there. That the court has not been, the Court of Appeal has not been very specific. They haven't prejudged the question. And I do have to acknowledge that in the Saugeen First Nation case, it does appear more like the Court of Appeal is saying that equitable compensation may potentially flow from the breach of treaty rights. And Ms. Crew already dealt with and dealt with well why that case is distinguishable. But there's one additional point that I wanted to make about Sagin. 
the discussion of equitable compensation in that case was all about why a constructive trust affecting municipalities wasn't an appropriate remedy in order to get the municipalities out of the case. That's why it came up there. And the point that I wanted to make was that that's very traditional trust law thinking, that a property interest over the roads wasn't an available remedy. So equity might be concerned about what the value of that property was at the date of the trial. So there might be a trust analogy in that case, on the facts of that case that, are, that isn't present here. But as Ms. Crew noted, that case was not dealing with the remedies phase of that proceeding. So the court has left that open. And I'd submit that not much more can be drawn from that case or those comments from that case. Your Honor, I see it's 1230 and I'm moving on to a new topic. I will tell you that I'm a little bit behind my one hour prediction. Um, but I'm not doing that bad, I guess. Well, I, I would estimate that I'd have about half an hour after the lunch break, if that would be acceptable to the court. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll take the break. I'll just give me a moment to catch up, please. We'll break till two then. Support us to down until two PM. <laughs> 